All right, folks, thank you so much for joining our noontime webinar. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Jamie Weiss, and I'm the Habitat Hero Coordinator for Audubon Rockies. And I get the pleasure to co-host today's presentation with John Zuzzi, who is the proprietor of Rim River, Rim River Farms and Gardens. And he is going to be talking to us about garden photography, the budding floral photographer's paradise. So for today's presentation, we're going to take a unique look at gardening and amateur floral photography that can produce high quality garden based photographs that can be shared and displayed with pride. This beginner to intermediate level floral photography webinar explains the types of cameras, lenses, and simple techniques to use to capture exquisite garden photographs, including several of the local garden wildlife and pollinators. We'll also focus on topics on how to develop a keen eye for, say, natural lighting effects, framing and composition, and also the use of basic camera settings and other do's and don'ts or tips and techniques. So thank you all for joining us. And we'll um, give a quick introduction for the first five minutes, and then I'll be passing over the presentation over to John Zuzzi. So first thing, here's a, some housekeeping items. Your phone lines have been muted for the convenience of yourself and the others, um, since we do have quite a good number of participants today. Uh, we will have a Q&A portion after the main presentation of today's webinar. So use the chat feature on the toolbar at the bottom to type your messages or questions directly to me throughout the session. We'll also be recording today's presentation, and it will be available uh, just in case you have to cut out early or if you want to pass today's presentation on to other friends families, or coworkers. After the presentation today, we'll also send some additional links and materials and websites for you to check up on. And again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have your lunch handy and your refreshment ready. Uh, we have a lot of information to cover, so we're going to kick off and get started now. So first thing, I just want to give a quick little introduction on the Habitat Hero program before I uh, introduce John and pass it over to him. Um, but for those of you who might know about the Habitat Hero Program, a program of Audubon Rockies that provides the resources to community members that help in planting gardens that are not only water-wise, but support wildlife. So truly, we're helping bringing conservation home, creating these bird-friendly gardens one at a time, <laughs> helping to stitch back the landscape together. And also, we want to give you the recognition that you deserve through our certification program. Anyone can be a Habitat Hero, even you. Habitat Heroes are individuals who make a positive impact in either our Colorado or Wyoming community by increasing those natural areas, providing homes and food for wildlife, and creating small areas of wildlife habitat that can connect those larger green spaces together. So the landscape you're tending to might be your typical residential yard. Uh, maybe a smaller space, a few potted plants on a balcony can make a difference. Could be at a public park, a schoolyard garden, you name it. Doesn't uh, matter the size of the garden, where it's located, or even the design. It's all about growing a healthier community for birds, wildlife, and people. So if this sounds like you, I certainly encourage you to apply to get you that recognition that you deserve. Um, a, new com a new component of our application process this year is a tiered approach. So that can help recognize folks that might just have started out with their gardening efforts to folks that are seasoned green thumb enthusiasts that might be wildscaping that last corner of the yard. Uh, during today's presentation by John, we're going to learn all about garden photography, which will be a useful tool to help inspire others um, to create gardens like yours. And we'd love to see before and after photos, too. So maybe John can give you some more information on that. So for more information, I'll be sending um, the, the information out in the follow-up email that addresses those FAQs, the web pages, the application tips and components, and all of that. So I don't want to take up too much time regarding that. So without further ado, I want to introduce our lovely speaker, John, today. John Zuzzi, he is our proprietor of Rim River Farms and Gardens. And as the immediate past president of the Garden Club of Durango, fun fact, he was the first and only male member in the club's 75-year history. Congratulations, John. Uh, Mr. Zuzzi will be blending his stories of his down and dirty gardening techniques and seed harvesting methods into his presentation of several photographs he has captured 
during the course of his long-running love affair with flowers of all shapes, sizes, and colors. Rim River Farms and Gardens is operated by John Zuzzi and is located about three to four miles south of Durango, Colorado, so looking at southwest Colorado, situated along the long-running rim of the Florida Mesa, overlooking the Los Animas River, uh, River Valley, with the westward view towards the La Plata Mountains. It sounds beautiful. I wish I was there right now. It's also located in the high desert of southwest Colorado, enjoying the almost perfect horticultural conditions for growing a wide variety of annual, biannual, perennial, and cottage garden flower species, traditional heirloom favorites, hybrids, and numerous native wildflowers. Every flowering plant is grown, every seed is harvested, and every photograph is captured with a deep, genuine affection and special caring for the plants from Mr. John. John also has two dogs, a German short-haired pointer deemed Little Boy and an Australian Shepherd Big Dog, and they are in charge of keeping out all those pesky creatures like your deer, your rabbits, your chipmunks, and squirrels. So without further ado, John, I will be passing over the screen to you so you can kick off your presentation. And like I said at the end, we will follow up with a Q&A portion. So thank you again for joining us. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Great. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Jamie. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I am going to show a few um, uh, before and after photos uh, about the property. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to thank uh, Audubon Rockies for inviting me to this uh, great little program. This is the first time I've ever done one of these, so uh, we'll see how it goes. But I thought I'd first start uh, by showing everyone um, just where I'm located down in uh, southwest Colorado. I'm about only 14 or 15 miles from New Mexico and maybe 60 or 70 miles from Utah. I'm going to focus, I'm going to scroll in on this so you can uh, see how I'm set up. Um, and I'll, we'll go kind of slow. Uh, you can see I'm just south of Durango. And as we come in a little closer, let me get it back to the center. We've got a, a river that runs down. There's Durango, a little bit north of me. And the Los Animas River runs south down through the, the Los Animas River Valley. I'm going to see just how close I can get here to kind of show you the layout of my property. You come down this highway. 550 outside of town, and uh, I'm in a little uh, development here. I've got four acres of land. Two acres is up on, this is the rim of the mesa that kind of runs along the edge here. And I've also got two acres of land that is out over the, over the rim of the mesa. Uh, you can see my front gate is my driveway because that's going to be the first photograph I show you. Uh, these are some cabins I built, and a little pole barn, and my gardens are situated here along the driveway uh, mostly. I've also got a little garden in the middle of my driveway down here. It looks like this photograph was taken by uh, Google last fall, and I can tell because my firewood is, is covered by my tarp last year. So I'm going to minimize this, and I'm going to bring up uh, my Nikon uh, camera program. And I'll uh, start. Here's the entrance to my property. This, is, uh, this photo was taken about a year after I acquired the property, and I was starting to put in this gravel driveway. Where this blue tarp is uh, is uh, kind of where my garden starts. And so once you go through the gate, this is back when I first uh, acquired the property. And as you can see, there's no gravel driveway. I just drove in on the dirt, kind of created a, a road through the trees. And over here in this big mess with this old dead tree, and uh, dead, this is where I decided to put my garden. Uh, and as you go walk a little bit down farther, uh, I put the little driveway garden down here where that tarp is. So those are the before pictures. And this is what it looks like now. 
Uh, in fact, this photo was taken a couple of days ago. Um, and you can kind of see the layout of the land. Anyway, I, I first started by uh, building a little cabin uh, here in the, in the trees. And then I added on a larger cabin. Uh, I don't have any running water. I don't have central heat. Uh, in fact, I have to go outside to get to my kitchen and to my closet. Uh, but I, I, I've been in this setup for now six, seven, eight years, and I, I love it out here. Uh, we were talking about the view north towards Durango. The reason I call my little business Rim River because we're right on the rim of the mesa, overlooking the river, and uh, we generally look west out to the La Plata Mountains. Uh, Jamie had mentioned my dogs. This is little boy, Tyler. He's a German short hair pointer. And this is Fred, who I call Big Dog. He's an Australian shepherd. Anyway, this is the first little garden I had. <laughs> right in the middle of the driveway, I, uh, I used to just kind of drive around this way. Uh, and I decided to put a little fence up keep the dogs out. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Um, but anyway, when I first started, I uh, went and bought a few packs of, I think, uh, mixed flower seeds. And I was pretty successful. I had to haul water at this point from town because I didn't have my well hooked up. I had no running water. So this little garden all came about as a result of uh, water that I brought to the property. Again, that's what it looks like now. I've also, um, this is when I added the the garden beds next to the driveway, and I got a couple shots of that uh, north and south. And then a couple years ago, I, I bought some old uh, bricks, old used bricks, so I could do some terracing uh, to help uh, moisture retention. You see all these hoses laying around. I've tried a number of different uh, watering systems. Uh, the only one I have found that it works well and is the most efficient is hand water. So I water everything by hand. Uh, it gives me a good chance to get out to the garden and look at things and see what's going on. Um, and so I've always enjoyed hand watering. I've also put in some raised beds, and I want to point out one little thing to you. You'll see some of this galvanized screening. This one and this one are half inch, and this one is a quarter inch. I mostly put that up to discourage uh, the dogs from getting into my beds and also from discouraging rabbits and the other critters from getting in there. Uh, so I want to talk about, oh, I want to first show you um, the cameras I use. I'm going to minimize this again and bring up uh, this document. This is the camera I first started with. It was a little Nikon. They call it a Coolpix. And this one uh, has a 10 power a telescopic lens, telephoto lens. Um, it's a great little camera. The nice thing about the telescopic feature is that, uh, especially with some of the wildlife and the, and the birds and flying insects, it would help me to get close uh, quick. Uh, it would also let me take pictures uh, of a flower that might be a little bit further away from where I was standing at the time. But it does. It did a great job all the way from close-ups to long distance. Uh, photographs. And then a couple of years ago I decided to um, increase my capabilities. Uh, and I, so I bought another Nikon, this model, not with that particular lens. This is the lens I got for that camera. It's, a, it's called a micro lens, which allows for a little bit uh, better close-up photography. It doesn't have a telescope telephoto feature. So the one downside to it is I have uh, been less able to take uh, pictures of the flying birds and insects, although I try as best I can 
Anyway, I just wanted to show you that. Um, anyway, so let's talk about what a photograph is. And uh, obviously, it's a historical record of an instant in time at a given location. And so uh, you it's a two-dimensional creation which depicts three dimensions. And uh, it can also be, I suppose, a form of art um, where you capture uh, your what you're looking at at a particular point in time. Uh, moving objects, by the way, are a little bit tricky. In fact, I, I started my moving object photography back when I uh, was into race cars, and I uh, took a number of photographs of racing pictures. But in any event. I also think that photos tell a story, uh, and flowers particularly uh, have a lot of expression and personality, and of course color. They've got lots of details, uh, and I just enjoy trying to capture images um, that tell a little bit of a story and make the viewer kind of think about what they're looking at. I always wind up with some surprises. You see this little bug here, this little fly. Uh, I didn't even know he was there when I first took that picture, I'm sure. So what makes a good picture? Well, uh, it's kind of hard for me to say. I judge a picture, whether it's good or not, as to whether I like the thing. And I think that uh, viewers also uh, kind of take that attitude. This one I, I kind of like because it just looks like a, a human face of some sort. Uh, but they, photographs can be very artistic. Here I captured some late uh, in the day sunlight and you see this spider web that had been built. Uh, and actually here's the little spider that built it. If you can see him over there, he's got these little red, red colored bands on his leg. Um, and we got another photograph of him coming up. Um, but anyway, I just kind of wanted to show uh, some beginning photographs. This one, I didn't even know it was going to turn out like this when I first took it. I just was, I noticed uh, this bright yellow light inside the throat of this little nasturtium, uh, which very interesting flowers that have these sharp tooth. Uh, protrusions along the, the petals of the flower. Um, anyway, oops, I'm going to go back to that one in case it didn't register. Uh, these are some native wildflowers. It's a, called an Eaton's Penstemon, and behind that are some uh, blue buckle penstemons. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to use the sky. As background, uh, you can even put in the mountains. Uh, this one's got the hay fields across the river. That's probably about a half a mile away, and these reflections down here, I think, is the water from the river. But I use raindrops and sprinkling drops of water to help highlight photographs. Uh, it's kind of nice because they capture the sun. And they give little reflections. That screening I showed you uh, before around my raised bed, that's what creates all of these uh, little circled light effects uh, for these gomfrinas, uh, purple colored gomfrinas. Anyway, so now I wanted to tell you about uh, how to select the subject. And when you take garden photography, uh, you can either select a single flower. And by the way, I, I tend, to, as I walk through my garden and I look around, I'm looking for, uh, for nice lighting. I'm looking also for nice blossoms, nicely shaped blossoms. Because not every flowering plant, all the blossoms will be perfect or not all of them, all of them will look good. But these in particular, 
I focused on uh, as just nice examples. You can uh, create these blurred backgrounds for your subject. Um, this is a little Centoria, Montana. It's uh, related to the bachelor button flower. Um, I think I will not give you all the flower names yet, but uh, if you're interested in the names of the flowers, uh, you can visit the website as well. But sometimes uh, I'll see a group of flowers of the same species that make a nice little collection. Um, these are some red columbines and some more cosmos. Here, these flowers uh, were grown at the edge of one of my beds, so the background for that is my native landscape. You can take pictures of lots of flowers all grouped together. And by the way, let me just say, none of my photographs are staged. Uh, everything that you see is in under natural lighting and the natural conditions as grown in the garden. I like this little amaranthus. It's called Love Lies Bleeding. I call it the Rastafarian uh, plant because uh, it looks like it's got these long dreadlocks. And these uh, blossoms just continue to grow all summer long. Um, very interesting plant. Uh, this is a flower called a salpiglossus, a painted tongue, and it comes in all different colors uh, to create a real nice bed of uh, very colorful blood. Yeah. These again are the are the amaranthus, and in the background is a little bed of petunias, which creates a real nice set of colored effects. I think. Uh, and again, I'm just going to flip through these different shots of uh, picking a subject and trying to frame it uh, as you want. I like to I like to try and set myself up before I take the picture with as many colors as I can in the background, if possible. Uh, but again, I'm looking for different kinds of lighting and just different little settings. Um, to take my photographs. On this one, I wanted to zoom in on this Shasta daisy just for a minute and to show you some detail of this, what will eventually become the seed head. And you can see these built-in patterns, these uh, curved patterns. Um, it's a, this is a special, I want to show you, uh, These patterns uh, that flower heads develop are are amazing to me. These numbers that you see on this screen are called Fibonacci numbers. Uh, some Italian guy back in the medieval days was studying flowers, and he came, he he studied all the patterns and all the curves, and he came up with this set of numbers that. Uh, flowers use uh, to build their seed heads. Another guy came along, an Italian named Vogel, and he put together, uh, he studied the mathematics behind these patterns. And what he discovered was that through evolution, uh, a flower can produce in a round cir circular space these patterns create the most space to fit the most seeds on the flower head, uh, which I find just an amazing evolutionary uh, feature of flowers. So that's that one. Uh, let's go back. And now I want to talk about focusing a little bit. Um, this picture. It looks like this flower bud over here on the left is the one closest to the camera. But if you take another shot, 
and change your focus, you'll see really that this unopened bud is the one that's closest. So focusing on your subject uh, can create different kinds of pictures. Here's one with some celosia up front and the lobelia is blurred in the back and you change your focus and you can change the uh, look of the photograph. There's a group of little zinnias uh, and you'll see that the yellow and the red one in the middle of the bunch are the ones in focus and so you create a, a visual image where the foreground is out of focus and the background is out of focus. Even uh, photographs that aren't truly in focus can produce some pretty good results like these asters and these little California poppies. Uh, and here's a, it's a little dianthus. Again, I like, I like this picture because it's got uh, pinks and reds and blues and purples, uh, lights and shadows. Here's another example with some colubines where you focus on the flower in front to get one look and you can focus, focus on the flower in the back to get another look. Uh, some more asters. And here's a little gazania, also out of focus a little bit. Still a nice photograph. Here you'll notice uh, when I take my photos, I, you know, I use the auto focus feature on my camera quite a bit. And that's one thing that I'm constantly being careful about because you'll see that just the edge of front edges of these petals on this particular shot are in focus and everything behind it is out of focus. But it still gives a kind of a nice effect. Um, same thing with these California poppies. They're kind of set out in their own little forest here. Just a lovely flower. You can also see the texture. And this is a this is a special little two tone variety of California poppies. But Jamie had mentioned that uh, I most I am most interested in lighting effects. <laughs> Pardon me. And for this one, I want to give you maybe teach you a new word, which I discovered very recently. It's called chiaroscuro. I think is how you pronounce it. Chiaroscuro. Uh, it's a pictorial representation in terms of light and shade without regard to color. The arrangement or treatment of light and dark parts in a pictorial work of art. Interplay of contrast, dissimilar quality, lights and shadows, and the quality of being veiled or partly in shadow. And so that's what uh, this next little gallery, I'm going to show you different types of lighting effects, uh, either where the sun is at the top of the flower blossom or backlit or from the side. Uh, some have shadows. Um, some are even going to be without any direct light at all. But you can see, I think, as we uh, scroll through these photographs, the different types of lighting effects. Here's a little spotlight that I noticed on this one uh, flower where the, uh, most of the bud was in shade except for the very center. Uh, and that creates kind of a nice visual effect sometimes when there's a spotlight either on the flower or coming through the throat of the flower as with these Canterbury bells. Uh, here's a sunflower with its backlit. Um, here the love lies bleeding again with direct sunlight on the front, and I want to show you uh, what you can get with lighting from behind. Uh, the, the foliage of this particular plant is, is quite something. It's fairly unique. Uh, I go back one. It's, it starts green like most plants, but then the foliage of this particular flower species uh, then turns colors. The stems also turn a bright red. Just a, a great plant. This is a little agastache that's backlit. And here's the same flower with front lighting. 
Uh, I wanted to show you these. This is called a catch fly. And this one, this photograph was taken in the sun. And just a few seconds later, a cloud came overhead and created that kind of an effect. So cloud cover uh, can also have a lot to do with the way your photographs turn out. Here's one without any direct light at all. Uh, this is a uh, slip of a thing uh, related to the hollyhock. Oh, it's a malva. Malva is a green. A very nice vein. And a little aster that has a spotlight on the top. Anyway, I'll shut up for a minute and just show you some more photographs. Though this one, these are not discolorations. Uh, this entire blossom was is the same color. It's red. But here what we have are spotlights and shade from the tree above it uh, showing different shadows. And you get full sun with a sky background. This one, the black background comes because this area was totally in shade as the sun was just lighting up this little catch fly blossom set of blossoms. Here's another backlit shot that you can see the effects. And what it really does is it it it, it brings out the colors, I think, of the blossom. Uh, we got a little bug centered here on this cosmos that's both in sun and in shade. Uh, some columbines uh, that are uh, great, great to photograph. You'll see some more columbines along the way. This is a native flower down here in southwest Colorado called the blue flax. Uh, that's very expressive. This is a, f a flower called a cosmidium. Uh, and with the backlit, you see a lot of reds and oranges and yellows. But when it's frontlit, it's kind of a chocolatey brown uh, color. And I have a, another photograph of that later on. But you get a lot of different effects from the sunlight and positioning yourself in relation to the subject matter you're taking a picture of in relation to the sunlight. Um, this a late in the day photograph with the sun not too far out of the frame of your camera can cast the sun ray uh, uh, traits to the photograph, which is kind of nice. Here's a, a clary sage doing the same thing, and another sunflower. This is an early morning shot where uh, these tenstamens. And there are expressive lips and tongues and uh, reproductive parts just kind of catch the light. And this is a little straw flower. These flowers are interesting because they open and close every day. Uh, you can almost sit there and watch them open up in the morning. Um, it doesn't take too long. It takes them about an hour or so to unfurl all their petals which aren't true petals, by the way. These are colored uh, calyx, calyxes uh, on that particular flower. Some African daisies and some cosmos with some backlighting. I call this one the, the gabbling ducks. Uh, it's a number of snapdragons. Uh, snapdragons are a fun flower to grow because of all the different colors uh, and shapes that they come in, very expressive. Anyway, I'm just trying to show, here's a, this is called a blue shrimp plant, and the leaves are spectacular. Uh, they're actually kind of an emerald green blue tone to them, and they can capture the sunlight as well to create a nice visual effect. Uh, these are some uh, poppies. Iceland poppies, very delicate flowers. Uh, I've got a lot more photos of these, which uh, 
they come down from the top, but I thought this one was interesting, the pink against the blue background. Uh, another kind of aster that just shows how, uh, what kind of personalities these, these things can, can produce. Columbines, great reproductive parts and detail, uh, and the little tails. By the way, a columbine, I think, is named columbine because of the parts that come out the back, uh, which apparently represent the, the claws of a, of a hunting bird. So, Petunia and a Tithonia. You'll notice these, the, this little light, this little spotlight back here. That's really, pro that's probably, these are probably drops of water. Uh, that are then reflecting the sunlight back to the camera. So a few more showing uh, various effects of backlighting, front lighting, side lighting, and direct lighting. Living stone daisies or columbine. It's just, a, it's just amazing the way these things catch the light and create all the color. Uh, let's see. All right, so what are some common mistakes uh, that I've made in the past? Uh, no, we're not going to go that way. We're going to do close-ups first. <laughs> so I got out of order. With this, that macro lens I have, um, you can really get close to the reproductive parts of the flower and the details and the design, texture, colors. This is a, a purple poppy um, and a cosmos that uh, has some nice veining but you can you can see the, the texture in the, in the petals that I find real interesting. This is a straw flower again that uh, folds up at night and unfurls in the morning uh, and they make nice photographs. It's a little red salvia. And by the way, a caveat to the Nikon camera, I have found that uh, both of my Nikon cameras had a very, uh, very much trouble focusing on red, on the color red. Um, this is one of, uh, most of my pictures of these red salvia come out blurred. And it's hard to see the distinction. But um, that one turned out. Here's another little columbine. And the close-ups, what the close-ups do is they get you. You'll also notice that uh, here these petals in front uh, are out of focus. Uh, this is a, a pretty good example of what's called depth of field, which in a close-up only goes for a very short distance, a quarter of an inch, maybe in half an inch. Where only a, a very small depth of field is in focus, and you get um, blurred foregrounds and backgrounds uh, in front of and behind the, the focal points. But the nice thing about it is you can see such detail uh, and create um, nice visual effects with the close-up lens. Uh, this is a, a lily that has some, some great reproductive parts. This is one of my favorite photographs, I have to be honest, of a columbine, just because of the black on white and the different tones of the red and pink uh, with the reproduct reproductive parts uh, held in shadow in the middle. And when you get up real close to some these flower blossoms, this is a little, uh, what's called a, this is a bachelor button and a double blossom. Um, you can just create nice visual effects with the close-up. This, uh, this is a scarlet 
of flax uh, related to the blue flax we saw earlier, uh, mostly a garden variety. And these highlights are really developed because the blossom was moist when I took this picture. And these are the reflections of the sunlight that go around the edges. It's kind of a nice photograph. Again, here you can see the depth of focus is not very deep. Uh, the reproductive parts closest to the camera are out of focus. Um, and then as you go down into the uh, deeper into the flower blossom, you lose your focal point altogether. But what it can do is it creates uh, nice visual effects where um, you just it just kind of forces the viewer to look at the picture more uh, and think about what's going on. When you take these close-ups, you can also you start to notice the details and the fine little hairs and uh, the fine little parts of, of each blossom, uh, which I I find interesting. Here's where the focal point is up front, uh, with these petals that are closest to the camera. And then you lose your focus as you go back. Again, the water droplets. Uh, I've taken a few where uh, I have wound up uh, with a reflection in the water droplet, although I don't have one to show you today. I call these the little uh, white hot dog buns for this desert bluebell. Pretty neat parts and a petunia that's been watered. In fact, there's a little pool of water sitting there in the throat of that flower. <coughs> Pardon me. This is an oriental poppy. Um, and by the way, on this particular flower, just uh, for your information, these are the stamens, the male parts that produce the pollen. And the female parts to this flower bud are these little stripes uh, that go around. The pollen falls down onto the female parts, and uh, then the seeds are created in this little acorn-shaped capsule, uh, where they're, they're, each one of these female stripes uh, has a flange that then goes down inside the capsule, and the seeds are grown on each side of the flange. Very interesting. Anyway, let's see. This is a hollyhock. Um, I like this one just because of all the different shades of red and the detail with the texture. There's a little dianthus called a spider flower. Uh, See those little hairs going up out of the, out of the petals themselves. Another hollyhock and an aster. So now we're going to talk about some mistakes you can make. Anybody see the mistake I made in this one? I didn't move the truck. Um, had I moved the truck, this would have been a pretty nice photograph. Uh, I actually I tried to save it by uh, minimizing and cropping it later on, but I ruined this photograph by not moving the truck. Here I forgot to move the dog. I wanted to take a picture of this uh, nice little snap pea, and I got a dog and a pile of lumber and a tent in the background, a hose and a couple of fences. Anyway, so you can. It's easy to forget what's behind uh, your, the subject of your photograph if, you, if you're not cognizant of it when you're taking the picture. Here I forgot to move the orange buckets, my work buckets, so that ruined that photograph. 
And then here I just missed the focus. I focused on the plant below the blossom instead of the blossom. So that would have been a nice picture, but it's not. So now I want to talk about, uh, let's see, cropping uh, and editing your photographs. And I picked this one. Because when you buy a Nikon, or when I bought the Nikon camera, it comes with this program I'm showing you. In fact, I want to show you, it lets you categorize and, and file things in different places. Uh, but, the, but one thing is, it's got a built-in, uh, like a Photoshop type of application. And so I wanted to show you about cropping in this program, when you come down here in this drop down box, you get a number of different selections. You can do a square, uh, okay, you can do a square crop, you can move it around, um, or you can do, I like to do, we're going to cancel that one, I like to do the free crops, but you can do different, you, you can see here on this drop down list different standard size photographs, 5x7, 8x10, 9x16, both in landscape and portrait. Or you could do it by number of pixels. Okay. I like to do the free crops, however. And what that allows me to do when I start is to focus in on just what it is that I want to highlight. For example, Maybe this area of the photograph. And you can adjust the edges. You can, like I said, you can move the whole thing up and down. Uh, you can grab a corner and do two sides at once. Okay. And I'm going to put this right here. And the nice thing about this is when you then select what you want to highlight, and if you apply that, now you create a, a, a cropped photograph. Um, and so you can, uh, you can select your subject matter for, whatever, for your finished product. Some of the other features um, are, I'm going to just scroll these things and you can see a little bit how you can sharpen your photographs by moving that slider. You can change the contrast. Okay. Uh, you can change the brightness so that if you have one that's a little bit overexposed or underexposed, you can get it to where it looks better. Uh, you can protect your highlights. I don't see much different on that one. And your shadows. Uh, that's not a good photograph. And here's a color booster. You can even juice them up a little bit get to get really uh, psychedelic coloring. So it's kind of a neat program. Uh, what else? Yeah. I wanted to show you that. I like to also take photographs and stretch them out. Uh, oh, it reminds you. Do you want to save these things? If you click no, then it goes, it takes you back to the original that you started with. So you can always find the original after you have manipulated your photograph. But I like to, uh, to create these super landscapes, uh, that tend to tell a little bit of a story and, uh, show some, a little bit more personality in the photograph itself. I'm just going to flip through a few of these of different settings, different colors, um, so you can see how cropping can make your photograph completely different from what you started with. And even with a close-up, kind of nice with different colors. These are some native onions uh, that grow locally in the mountains here. 
Indian This is why I didn't notice this till just the other day. I'm gonna focus in on him. This is some weird spider type of an insect, I think. I don't know. I didn't notice him till just the other day. And now you can see this is the one with the truck in the background. This is the best I could do to save that. So at this point, I want to show you some uh, pollinators uh, that are around the garden. And I thought we might bring in a little bit of, uh, of a theme song here that we'll play in the background. Maybe you guys have heard this song before. It's a great old song. <laughs> I'm trying to close it out. So that was, I was having a little fun. But anyway, when I walk around my garden, uh, I look at the insects and, and the critters that might be around too. And I try and sneak up on them as best I can and uh, try and capture them up close or from a distance. But there's all kinds of stuff out there. And they're really interesting. Uh, I've never noticed, I've never known insects to have so many hairs before. Um, I caught this little grasshopper uh, down in the middle of a lily with some nice lighting. And I think I might have been watering when I saw him. Another the, another little hairy bug. He's on a Shasta daisy. No, that's not a Shasta. That's a straw. And this is my friend Oscar. Uh, it's called a blue fence lizard. Uh, there's a lot of them in the garden. Uh, I like having them around because uh, they will eat some of the bad bugs. And they'll catch some of the destructive grasshoppers. I uh, don't have too many slugs here in Durango, but there are some horn worms uh, that are pretty destructive. Anyway, uh, Oscar's good at catching those. And uh, in this picture, I said, "Hey, Oscar, show us, show the folks your blue throat." What? Huh? Anyway, he's a friendly, friendly guy. I like this little bee. He's got these big buggy eyes. And we'll see another shot of, of him or one of his cousins here in a minute. Here's an interesting creature. I don't know what it's called. I don't know what it is. Uh, and I, I saw him. I started taking photographs of him. I got real close and his jaws opened. So I thought I had better back off before he ate my camera. But he, he flew over to a glass window. And I just wanted to show you the incredible camouflage that this guy's got uh, to his body. And the close-up, he's even got a mustache and a uh, armored collar. But you can see all these little joint connections. Uh, pretty interesting. So this guy is just amazing. I like to try and catch uh, flying insects in mid-flight. And this honeybee was just getting ready to land on the nasturtium. So he creates his own shadow. Um, and I like this picture because of the of sun reflection. And he's nicely in focus, also reflected. Uh, I saw this ant walking around. Uh, and thought it, 
it looks interesting. Again, you get the texture of the leaves and the shadow on his legs. Just makes it interesting. A bee coming around behind. Uh, this is a Rocky Mountain bee plant. And the ants, they, the ants love these flowers. Constantly on them. Here's the sphinx moth. Uh, it's also called a hummingbird moth. And this photo I find interesting because it's proboscis. You see how long it is? It goes all the way down into the nectar of the of the flower blossom. But you've got a nice hairy back, stripes. And this is my friend George, a little hummingbird. Uh, you can see the pollen from hollyhocks on his nose that he's carrying with him. This is his mate, Georgette. One thing I've found interesting about this photograph, if we zoom in, you see that blue colored hue on, along the top of her beak. Uh, I don't know where that blue came from, unless it's just built into the beak somewhere. And this is George uh, showing off and doing his uh, his cross for me. And here he's flying upside down, trying to get into that hollyhock. I've learned something about insect wings. Um, oh, and I want to be careful of my time. Yeah, John, if you want, we can... Um it, just to be respectful of some other folks' times, we can jump over onto my screen. I can pull it back. We can do some Q&A, kind of wrap things up, and then if people want to stick around for maybe another 10 minutes, John, we can go back to your screen. You can finish up some pictures if you'd like. All right. That'd be great. I'll just flip the room at the end. Let me get everything set up on our end. Did everyone just love that? I sure did on our end. It was so uh, engaging and informative. I wish I could take photographs like that. And now that I know some of your tips and techniques, I'm going to have to go out and try some of your tips and techniques. So thanks so much for sharing all that great information with us, John. Your your pictures are stunning, too. Sure. And it made me feel like I was in your garden. I've been to Durango before, but I've uh, not been to your exact place, but I really felt like I was there, especially with how you've captured those photos. It was like I was walking in your garden, not even looking at a computer screen. So thank you so much. <laughs> sure, you're welcome. Thank you yeah, for joining so I me. Have, for having me. Yeah. I have our contact information up on the screen since we do have just a few minutes to go over some uh, Q&A, if you will, and then I'll just remind you of some upcoming Habitat Hero events. Uh, but feel free to give us a um, jingle. We have our website and our email addresses for both myself, Habitat Hero Coordinator for Audubon Rockies. Again, my name is Jamie Weiss. And then John Zuzzi, the proprietor of Rim River, Rim River Farms and Gardens. That's a tough mouthful to say. Uh, but one question for you. Uh, your camera is just so lovely, that Nikon. But what, what, um, what tips or techniques would you recommend, John, to achieve similar results like your pictures, you know, maybe with a less than a high-tech camera? So many folks walk around with iPhones in their pockets. Could you achieve maybe not the best um, images, but w what would you recommend using an iPhone for, for grabbing some of these photos? Well, I would probably use – I don't have an iPhone. I've, I've never owned one. So I don't know what the camera and photography quality is from them. But I would think that you would want to uh, stay close up to, the, to a blossom. And uh, again, I don't know how they focus if they have an autofocus technique. One thing that's nice to do with autofocus on my cameras is you can push the button halfway down to uh, generate the autofocus feature. And then you can move the camera with the button pushed halfway down before you actually take the photograph. So that's one, one feature of my cameras that I like to have. And I'm not sure that would also be available on an iPhone or a smartphone. OK. But I've never yeah, taken one. one. <laughs> One other question for you, too. Um, depending on what growing zone you're in, 
whether you think uh, you know different growing zones might produce different types of photographs or are there other limitations and this comes up because with our um, geography we deal with so many folks and communities in both Colorado and Wyoming would would that have any effect on the the pictures probably not but as you may or may not know growing zones are determined based upon uh, historical cold temperatures. The coldest temperature of each winter season is, uh, is uh, captured for, and it's a 30-year average of the lowest cold temperature for each winter. And that determines a growing zone. And so in the Durango area, uh, actually, there are multiple growing zones within close proximity. Um, so I'm not sure a growing zone would have much impact on a photograph rather than sun and shade and uh, clouds and that type of thing. Well, I just pulled up, so thank you for answering those, those questions. Um, again, we had our contact information up there. If you come across some other additional questions you would like John or myself to answer, please send us um, your questions. Um, I did want to leave you with some upcoming events that we do have. We have one more noontime webinar in two weeks. Uh, Amy Yarger, the horticulture director for the Butterfly Pavilion, will be co-presenting that and will be talking about how to create year-round habitat for pollinators. And then we also have two movie showings. One is September 11th at the Boulder Public Library and the other is October 18th at Denver Botanic Gardens. And the movie Hometown Habitat, Stories of Bringing Nature Home, shows what everyday Americans are doing to help bring back more native species through projects and programs across the country. It's about a 90-minute environmental education documentary. And we're excited because in May of 2015, our Habitat Hero program was actually filmed for additional footage for the movie. So I, this is my five minute of fame in the movie. <laughs> uh, but we were filmed during a planting event and a workshop that we had in Fort Collins. And we're honored to be selected as one of these inspiring stories of community commitment to this conservation landscaping. So I hope you come out to one of these uh, movie showings or to uh, join us for our next noontime webinar. Um, I know to be sensitive of folks' times, I just want to thank you again, John, a big, big thank you for that informative presentation. Your garden photography webinar hopefully inspired uh, you folks at home some of these tips and techniques to go out and start snapping photos of your, your garden, applying to become a habitat hero, sending those in with the application. And I know, John, you had a few photos. I, I didn't mean to cut you off with the Hummingbird series with George and Georgette. If you wanted to just finish up that series, and then we'll wrap up for today. It's OK. And I also wanted to plug my website, uh, which can be found at rimriver.com. I've got a lot more photographs. In fact, I've got a lot of updating to do this website. And it has a lot of information about particular flowers as well and growing and maintenance information. And how to collect seeds as well. So are you are you am I are we gonna go back to